Hi, I'm Catherine. And I'm Gail. And we are delighted to welcome advocate Dr. Cheryl Woodson to our show today. Hello. Thanks for having me. Well, we're so happy to have you, and we're looking forward to a great conversation. And, you know, Cheryl, you've roared into retirement after 40 years in medicine. You've worn many hats, academic geriatrician, primary care doctor, employed physician and entrepreneur in your own medical practice, public policy expert, and private family caregiver. And you're also an author and speaker. So you have a lot to talk with us about. What I loved hearing you say is that you believe women should live out loud and age. <laughs> and as an advocate for families to give excellent elder care without destroying their own health, finances, or relationships, you empower all adults to age excellently. So That's thank great. you. Yeah, you do. So thank you so much for being here. And, uh, you know, let's let's start by hearing a little bit of your background, you know, why academic geriatrician and physician and, and tell us something about you. Well, I was raised in North Philadelphia in a very close, huge extended family. I knew three of my grandparents very well. So old people weren't scary. They protected you from your parents. <laughs> <laughs> and as a resident, I got tired of hearing young white male physicians call older black women by their first names. Mm -hmm. And also to deny people care just because of the date they came on the planet. So I was able to stop that from happening on my service once I became a senior resident, but I couldn't influence the surgeons and the cardiologists and all these other people. So I decided to do academic geriatrics so that I could train all docs how to take care of seniors. Mm -hmm. So I did my fellowship at UCLA and then was director of the fellowship program at the University of Chicago and realized that was too late. Fellowship is too late to start talking to docs about mm -hmm. older adults. So I went to Northwestern as director of all training in geriatrics. I had medical students and everybody. And mm -hmm. then my son got tired of mom driving three hours a day. <laughs> and I went to Ingalls Health System in Harvey because I lived in Homewood. And then in 2000, I got tired of working for men who didn't get it and went into solo private practice. And that was easily the best fun I've ever had professionally. <laughs> so who were your clients, uh, your, your patients then? Who, who were they? Well, when I went to Ingalls, I hadn't seen anybody under 65 in like 10 years. So at Ingalls, I was a primary care doc. And the first time I walked into a room and saw somebody 19, I went, <laughs> <laughs> but I did general medicine, uh, more like family medicine, but I had people who were 100 and people who were 80 something taking care of them and people 60 something taking care of them. And so I had the whole family mm -hmm. and it was wonderful. I mean, my office was in Chicago Heights, which is a blue collar community. And so it was regular work a day folks trying to survive. And I just loved every minute of it. So you know, some, may I just ask um, a friend of mine, a colleague of ours is, um, has been a primary care doctor specializing in women's health, older women's health. And she's very concerned about that there aren't enough people going into geriatric medicine. And is that your experience? That's absolutely true. And in the second edition of my book, To Survive Caregiving, I have a whole chapter about why that is. Mm -hmm. The demographics do not drive the dollars. The fact that older people are the fastest growing population doesn't change the fact that Medicare only pays 60% <laughs> of, of what things cost. And that even though the healthcare changes are supposed to support keeping people healthy, mm -hmm. they still primarily pay for procedures. And there's no gyroscope. <laughs> we don't have a procedure to bill for. So there's just not a lot of ways to survive financially. And then because there are so few people going into geriatrics, that means people who want to go in don't have mentors. And so they don't choose geriatrics, but if they do choose geriatrics, they don't have people to help them do what you have to do to get promoted, which is to do research and get grant money and publish. And it's just a lot of difficulty. It's not just about seeing patients. If you're going to be a leader in geriatric medicine, 
you have to learn how to run the business and you have to learn how to teach and mentor and write and all of that. And there's just not enough people teaching. And you have done all of that. Yep. <laughs> not just me. There are several of us. The problem is that there are not a whole lot of people behind us. I mean, I'm 65 years old. Uh, there's not a whole lot of people behind us. There are some great people coming, but I'm just not seeing a lot of people going into academic geriatrics at this point. What needs to change, do you think, for that to happen? I have a chapter about that too. I think there needs to be loan forgiveness for people who go into primary care. And that's not just medicine, but nursing and social work and hospital administration. I think that there needs to be more exposure to geriatrics in medical school. So even if you don't have faculty at your institution, there's a lot of us who'd be happy to come out and give presentations and talk to kids. But I think somebody valuing it and valuing older adults. I mean, there is an ageism in this country that older adults are not as valuable. And as you can see, I know you just interviewed my mentor, Ms. Wilma. Older adults are not playing. They're doing a great job. So we just need to value that more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's hard to fathom that, that, that our, our society does not value older adults when we are so much of the percentage of people living on this planet. But the culture that created the United States of America is about physical strength, right? Mm -hmm. And money, neither of which people who are not valued in this country have <laughs> a lot of. So that hasn't caught up with what the reality of this country is. The vision that we have of ourselves is trash talk and braggadocio and very physically strong with a lot of money. That's not the truth for most of Americans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you were a public policy expert and a private family caregiver as well. Yes, I uh, took care of my mother who died of dementia. Mm -hmm. And in year seven of a 10 year caregiving relationship, she looked at me and said, do I know you? Oh, wow. I thought I was going to die. Mm -hmm. So having the family caregiving experience first as a long distance caregiver and then hands on, as well as the professional part of what you do in geriatrics forms the basis of my books. You know, to survive caregiving is a daughter's experience, a doctor's advice. And the problem is that many families can tell you poignant stories, but they can't advise you how not to step in the holes they stepped in along the way. And many professionals will write books and you wonder how, who said that was going to work <laughs> on what planet? So my job is to be very practical as well as being informative and understanding that you're not going to like it. This isn't going to be easy, but you can do it anyway and you can do it well. Uh, tell us about a few of those holes. The first hole is not understanding what it is your loved one needs. You know, I think one of the biggest problems for caregivers is this insecurity. Am I doing what's right? Am I giving them what they need? And so what you don't want to do is do too much and impose on somebody who's not that sick. I mean, I have a 94-year-old aunt who was working two days a week before the pandemic. I mean, she didn't need me. But you also don't want to do too little and actually neglect someone. So one of my concepts is the level of care prescription and it aims you right at the target. It tells you exactly what this person needs. And then we talk about how to get what they need based on the values of your family and the resources that you want to invest in this person's care. Hmm. Yeah. Do some caregivers fall into the, the trap that it, I have to do all this myself? Oh, absolutely. Um, and many of them are more invested in caregiving for their own needs. You know, there's codependency, there are people, nobody can do it as well as I can when they haven't really asked if anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are trying to revise history, you know, prove that the parent that mistreated them really shouldn't mm -hmm. have because they are a good kid, you know, mm -hmm. or that's just the way they've come to value themselves. They've taken care of everybody. It's not just this particular older adult. 
So it's a question of understanding that you are the number one resource that your senior has. You're watching out for the money and the house and all of that, but you have to take care of the one thing that keeps all of that going. So I used to tell families that if you want to be a really good caregiver, particularly if you don't want to have to make the nursing home choice, you need to go to Aruba for a week. <laughs> you, know, you need to find a way to go to the movies on a regular basis with things that make you stronger and make mm -hmm. you a better caregiver. Mm -hmm. The other thing I tell people is that you are the quarterback, not the line staff. You have to make sure this stuff happens. You do not have to do it yourself. And there comes a time when doing it yourself does not constitute good care. And that's a hard one for people. You promise to always give the best care, but what if that doesn't mean doing it yourself? That's a difficult concept for some caregivers to accept. What about uh, families that have uh, poor finances? Have poor finances? Mm -hmm. well, I don't have any money to bring in someone else who can take your place while you're quarterbacking. Yeah, there are a lot of community resources that people are not aware of, the things that come through the Department on Aging, area agencies on aging. Churches and other houses of worship have really stepped into that gap, though, trying to pull together resources for people. And that's why some of my discussions about how to live out loud and age excellently are important. You have to be intentional about planning for that time so that your children don't have that kind of problem. Mm -hmm. So, say more about that, could you? Yeah. Oh, I. A lot more. <laughs> I have so many wonderful women in my life, and I've been overwhelming Gail with all of these names of people she should interview. People who are just active and getting purpose and fulfilling their joy at as older people. And no, you can't do it like you used to. And if you worship sameness, you're lost because the only thing that's going to change, that's going to stay the same is that things change. So we have to be able to look at things and go, OK, what's plan B? And that's what the people that I've recommended to you have in common. You may not be able to do it the way you used to. I mean, my, one of my pastors used to say when you're young, young man playing basketball drives to the hoop. And a younger man develops a fadeaway jump shot, you still score. You may have to do things differently, but you can still be valuable. You can still be active and you can still find joy. And that's what it is. I mean, and also not denying that things are going to change. Because if you deny that things are going to change, there's no way to plan for things, either financially or physically or with your joy. So that's a lot of the stuff that I talk about. So are you saying that that it's really um, it's up to the older people to plan for their aging? It's, it's up to all people to plan for their aging. I mean, my aunt, who's 94 years old, was like that when she was 30. I mean, the person that you were who overcame all of the things you overcame, you're still that same person. Mm -hmm. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Don't don't hide your head in the sand when you're 30 and, and wait until you wake up one day and you're 80 and you need help. Or when you're 40 and need help. I mean, people need to take responsibility for intentionally living their lives as soon as you're grown. As soon as you are legally responsible for yourself, you need to do that. Be legally responsible for yourself. Yes. Yes. I think. I think it's great advice. It's great advice. So you're retired. Does that mean you're I not? I think working? we're frozen. You're retired. Yes, I am retired from working for other people. <laughs> I don't think I'm retired. I have lots of projects that I have on my plate and I'm just really having a lot of fun. Tell, tell us about some of those projects. Um. Well, I'm writing my two caregiver books. They're, they're getting ready to come out for full publication before Mother's Day. But I'm working on my second novel. I'm developing um, a, a online courses about how to live out loud and age excellently. And based on the book that I wrote for my daughter, Dear Lauren Love Mom, which is 31 days of affirmations for my daughter, for myself, and for you. And it's really about how to take care of yourself 
how to teach other people to treat you and how to walk through life with integrity and grace. You know, so I'm working on putting together online courses about those things. Um, and as you know, I, I write fiction and I love it. I write romance fiction for women who are about 50 and I take them to 70. <laughs> and it's, I call it love stories for women who thought it was too late to believe. <laughs> and it's pure mind candy for smart women. I mean, and I don't <laughs> write, you know, moody sociopathic men who need to be rescued by people because when you're 50, he's got to be more than cute. <laughs> he's got to right. bring something to the table. <laughs> so these are people who have families and guys who have their own developmental arc, but it's just a lot of fun and, and walking with women who, what I call are juggling and trying to drop only the rubber balls. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to take care of parents and kids and work and figure out what their original dream was. So I'm writing books about us. <laughs> Can you uh, tell us a couple of titles? If you could, the first if one is What the Mirror Sees. And it, the tag is, you can pretend, but you can't hide from what the mirror sees. <laughs> the one I'm, that's the one that came out in 2015. And um, it's right there behind me, what the mirror sees. And the one I'm working on now is called The Sounds of Cajun Spice. And I love it because spice usually smells or tastes, right? You don't hear it. But I heard so much music while I was writing this and I'm going to market it with a playlist. It takes place in Chicago and New Orleans. So, you know, the music is just phenomenal. And I'm going to be ready for my beta readers to look at it by the end of May. Um, my developmental el editor has already seen it once and he's going to see it again in, um, in May. So I'm looking forward to it. I usually self-publish because I had a young literary agent tell me that nobody would be interested in heroines that old. Oh. And I said, do you know how many women in this country are over the age of 40 and they have Kindles <laughs> and jobs and money, you know? And what she said to me was, well, can't you put a vampire in it? Because really? that's the time that tri Twilight was coming out. Mm -hmm. and earlier in my career, I would have been crushed. But what I said was basically, bless your heart. You know, keep living, sweetheart. <laughs> You're going to see. So I self-published, but I really love Cajun Spice. And I may pitch that to an agent. I may go traditional for that, at least until that doesn't work. But, you know, we'll see. And I have Four Corners of the Circle, which is about four little girls who grew up in Philadelphia. Two left, two stayed. Two were professional women. Two were family caregivers and homemakers. And three of them come together to rescue the fourth one from an abusive marriage, but they each have to heal the scars on their own hearts along the way. And I just love it. Just mm. having fun. I've got like five in the pipeline. <laughs> Where, when do, and when and how did this uh, creative writing uh, venture start for you? Writing has always been a place for me to hide. You know, it's because the paper hides your pain. You write things that you would get slapped if you said to your mother <laughs> or fired if you said to your boss, you know, that kind of stuff. So I've always written. And then I went to college at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, which is all about the writing. If you're taking an exam, Wesleyan will give you the information you were supposed to have memorized and then say, but what if this happens? So they care more about what you think and how you think than the individual details. And we had to write everything and not only defend your topic, but your word choice and your syntax. And it just taught us that words are a tool. Like one of the exercises was they had us put something in front of us that came out of our backpack or bookshelf and then hand it to the person next to you. So what's in front of you, you have no relationship to. And they asked us first to describe it as the most precious thing in the world. And then 15 minutes later to come back and describe it as the most disgusting thing in the world. And the whole, it's the same item, but the idea is that you use words to make people smell, feel, think, hear what you need them to hear as an author, if that's your job. So going to Wesleyan was a great thing for me. And while you were practicing in your academic world and your, 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 um, 
direct service? Were you also doing the fiction writing? I was writing nonfiction then. The first caregiver book came out in 2006 when I was in solo private practice. The other books, I was writing my pain and just leaving it in the drawer. And when I started to look at Cajun Spice, because Cajun Spice was actually the first thing I wrote, I realized that I hadn't buried the bodies deep enough. (laughs) So I wrote Mirror first because Cajun Spice was just too painful for me to write to deal with. So I left that in the drawer. I wrote Mirror first. And now I'm just getting back to Cajun Spice. And I'm, I've healed a lot. I mean, my daughter's book healed me. (coughs) Writing Dear Lauren healed me. Because I was writing supposedly for her. But as I wrote it, I actually heard that stuff Mm -hmm. in a way that I had been too busy to hear it while I was running and living through it. It's stuff my mother told me, stuff pastors told me, teachers, Mm -hmm. mentors, um, my girlfriends and their families and mothers. And so all of those words came back because you'll do things for your children that you won't do for yourself, right? So I wrote that to put it in front of her and ended up seeing it and healing myself. So I think that's the reason why I was able to go back and get Cajun Spice and start over. So of course, now you've piqued our interest. And, and what, what kinds of things are we talking about that needed healing, if you don't mind sharing? The very first affirmation in Dear Lauren, Love Mom is, I am worth it just as I am. Mm-hmm. And we have imposter syndrome, you know, where we, we're hiding behind it, thinking somebody's going to figure out we're really not as good as we think we are. And we just destroy ourselves for that. Um, there's another one that says control is an illusion. You know, who, who said you were going to be in control? And I can be very perfectionistic and very hard on myself. In fact, if you go on my website, it's drsherylwoodson.com. I have a blog about seeking excellence, not perfection. <laughs> because if you seek perfection, you're going to fail because we're human. Right. You're not going to ever be perfect. Right, for sure. And it brings shame. You know, when you seek perfection and fail, then you feel ashamed. And, you know, I'm a martial artist. I have a second degree black belt. And one of the things they always teach us is that you cannot break a board if you don't see it first. So if you're trying to turn around and break a board behind you, where your eyes go is where your body goes. So if you have shame and your eyes go down, your life goes down. Mm. So that was another big one that, that I helped. I heard there's one called she can ride, but she can't drive. It's about that little girl that sits on your shoulder and just when you're about to do something awesome, she says, who do you think you are? (laughs) And that's all those people that told you girls don't do that or don't make anybody angry or you're too fat or you're too ugly or you're not really that smart. You you have to excise those voices, but not throw the little girl out of the car because you're who you are because you overcame those fears for her. She was trying to protect you. And so you can't kick her out of the car because you wouldn't be you if you hadn't overcome her fears. So it's just about moving her out of the driver's seat and saying, I wasn't there when they hurt you, but I'm here now and I got this. You can you can trust me. So move on over. So those kinds of things as I was writing it spoke to things that were getting in my way as well. Hmm. Wow. I have to read your book. (laughs) <laughs> how many um how many how many books have you written about caregiving and how many more do you are, are you envisioning well the two that are i have one on caregiving that came out in 2006 then i did what the mirror sees in 2015 and then lauren's book just came out last mother's day and then the two new caregivers book will come out in may and cajun spice will come out when it comes out that's one of the things i have learned is not to put that kind of pressure on myself Mm -hmm. again you seek perfection about the perfect time for it to come out and then you get discouraged so cajun spice will come out when it's supposed to come out and then i think the next one is going to be four corners of the circle but that's four books it's a series Mm -hmm. um i have one called star catcher that's because i'm a sci-fi freak you know best The best Star Trek captain is Picard. I'm sorry. I'll argue anybody about that. Um, And so this one is set in the 24th century. So I've I've got all these ideas and they'll come out. There also is another nonfiction that has been too painful for me to write, but I'm working on it. It's, It's called The Doctor is Out. 
And it explains why I and many, many other dedicated docs are leaving medicine. Mm -hmm. What is it that's making it impossible for us to do this? And what needs to change in mm -hmm. order for us to do it? So I follow a patient from the emergency room all the way through the health system and at each stop say, why is this a problem? <laughs> and what do we need to do about it? Mm. I'm not sure I'm ready to write that yet. It's an important book. Yeah, definitely an important book you need to get out. I of. hope so. But you know, all of my books have a lot of humor in it because if you don't last, laugh, laugh, you slit your throat. <laughs> you know, you, you have to be able to look up and uh, not get mired down in how bad it is. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're a black belt. You're a sci-fi person. <laughs> you're uh, you're an author. I, I assume you're a speaker. Yes. Yes. And so it sounds like your life is very full. It is. And, you know, I was divorced after 25 years mm -hmm. and started dating just because I wanted to hang out. Now I wanted people to go out and do things with. And I met somebody. I was not expecting this. I didn't see it coming. And so we um, got together February of last year, February 29th. Right. And then the world shut down March 20th. <laughs> so right. we've been here. I mean, how to stress a new relationship. <laughs> but it has really been very wonderful. It's been very scary and very different. Mm -hmm. But um, it's definitely been worth it. Uh, I'm happy. To and that's you. another blog that I have on my nonfiction. My fiction website is about how to date after 60 safely. And so that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. That's important. <laughs> yeah, very I think the biggest thing is, and many of us were hurt, particularly in relationships early. Mm -hmm. And I had a woman who was telling me that some guy from her Bible study was asking her out. And I'm nosy. So I go, oh, where'd you go? And she said, I'm not going to go out with him. And I reached over and touched her and said, you know, you can't get pregnant and not graduate from high school. And I started laughing and she burst into tears because that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying your ex-husband couldn't run that on the woman you are today. Relax. You know, that can't happen to you again. You will see that coming. Go out and date. Nobody. You're not that little girl anymore. Mm -hmm. You are who you are. And you don't have to worry about that because if somebody gets to close to you and it turns out they don't deserve to be there, you go, ah, uh, no, <laughs> and you go on. It's, it's not the same thing. Just like going back to school. If you want to go back to school, you don't care what sorority you pledge now. Right, for sure. You don't care what cool people you're hanging with now. Just go. You're not all those things that stopped you when you were younger are not relevant anymore. <laughs> Let's go. This is good advice. I sure. <laughs> yes. I think the first thing, the first thing is to realize that you deserve it. You deserve to be healthy. You deserve to be happy. You deserve to not worry about what anybody thinks and to do what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. um, don't worry. I mean, a lot of times people will say, oh, you shouldn't do that. You know, you're too old to do that. If you are physically able to do it, do it. Sure. And if you're not physically able, let's find out why. Because if it's something that's fixable, then you go do it. And if it's not fixable, figure out how you might be able to do it another way. You don't have to be unhappy. You just don't. Right. Right. All good advice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was really Thanks. wonderful. Catherine, did you have any last comments? Um. I just think that this notion of aging excellently is a really, a really wonderful way to phrase it. Because we hear about aging positively, aging successfully, and they, um, they all have, they sound like some kind of a, a judgment as part of it. But aging excellently, that's your own, right? That's your own sense of what's What excellent. I really don't like is the whole thing of aging gracefully. There's nothing graceful about this. You have to grab it in the throat and drag it down the street. You know? And you have to age intentionally. You have to plan to do this. And again, the difference between excellence and perfection, you age excellently because you keep going up. Mm -hmm. If you look for excellence, you keep going up. You keep trying to find a better way to do it, another way to do it, a happier way to do it. So 
that's how I feel. That's that's why I say excellent. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. We very much appreciate your being here. And uh, we look forward to more conversations with you. Indeed.